Chapter sixty three of the Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter sixty three The Drop of Water. Rochefort had scarcely departed when Madame Bonacieux re-entered. She found Milady with a smiling countenance. "'Well,' said the young woman, "'what you dreaded has happened. This evening or to-morrow the cardinal will send someone to take you away.' "'Who told you that, my dear?' asked Milady. "'I heard it from the mouth of the messenger himself.' "'Come and sit down close to me,' said Milady. "'Here I am.' wait till i assure myself that nobody hears us why all these precautions you shall know milady arose went to the door opened it looked in the corridor and then returned and seated herself close to madame bonacieux then said she he has well played his part who has he has just now presented himself to the abbess as a messenger from the cardinal it was then a part he was playing yes my child that man then was not that man said milady lowering her voice is my brother your brother cried madame bonacieux no one must know this secret my dear but yourself if you reveal it to any one in the world i shall be lost and perhaps yourself likewise oh my god listen this is what has happened my brother who was coming to my assistance to take me away by force if it were necessary met with the emissary of the cardinal who was coming in search of me he followed him at a solitary and retired part of the road he drew his sword and required the messenger to deliver up to him the papers of which he was the bearer the messenger resisted my brother killed him oh said madame bonacieux shuddering remember that was the only means then my brother determined to substitute cunning for force he took the papers and presented himself here as the emissary of the cardinal and in an hour or two a carriage will come to take me away by the orders of his eminence i understand it is your brother who sends this carriage exactly but that is not all that letter you have received and which you believe to be from madame de chevreuse well it is a forgery how can that be yes a forgery it is a snare to prevent your making any resistance when they come to fetch you but it is d'artagnan that will come do not deceive yourself d'artagnan and his friends are detained at the siege of la rochelle how do you know that my brother met some emissaries of the cardinal in the uniform of musketeers you would have been summoned to the gate you would have believed yourself about to meet friends you would have been abducted and conducted back to paris oh my god my senses fail me amid such a chaos of iniquities i feel if this continues said madame bonacieux raising her hands to her forehead i shall go mad stop what i hear a horse's steps it is my brother setting off again i should like to offer him a last salute come milady opened the window and made a sign to madame bonacieux to join her the young woman complied rochefort passed at a gallop adieu brother cried milady the chevalier raised his head saw the two young women and without stopping waved his hand in a friendly way to milady the good george said she closing the window with an expression of countenance full of affection and melancholy and she resumed her seat as if plunged in reflections entirely personal dear lady said madame bonacieux pardon me for interrupting you but what do you advise me to do good heaven you have more experience than i have 
Speak, I will listen. In the first place, said Milady, it is possible I may be deceived, and that D'Artagnan and his friends may really come to your assistance. Oh, that would be too much, cried Madame Bonacieux. So much happiness is not in store for me. Then you comprehend it would be only a question of time, a sort of race, which should arrive first. If your friends are the more speedy, you are to be saved. If the satellites of the cardinal, you are lost. Oh, yes, yes, lost beyond redemption. What then to do? What to do? There would be a very simple means, very natural. Tell me what? To wait, concealed in the neighborhood, and assure yourself who are the men who come to ask for you. But where can I wait? Oh, there is no difficulty in that. I shall stop and conceal myself a few leagues hence until my brother can rejoin me. Well, I take you with me. We conceal ourselves, and wait together. But I shall not be allowed to go. I am almost a prisoner. As they believe that I go in consequence of an order from the cardinal, no one will believe you anxious to follow me. Well? Well, the carriage is at the door. You bid me adieu. You mount the step to embrace me a last time. My brother's servant, who comes to fetch me, is told how to proceed. He makes a sign to the postillion, and we set off at a gallop. But D'Artagnan, D'Artagnan, if he comes, shall we not know it? How? Nothing easier. We will send my brother's servant back to Bethune, whom, as I told you, we can trust. He shall assume a disguise and place himself in front of the convent. If the emissaries of the cardinal arrive, he will take no notice. If it is Monsieur d'Artagnan and his friends, he will bring them to us. He knows them, then? Doubtless. Has he not seen Monsieur d'Artagnan at my house? Oh, yes, yes, you are right. Thus all may go well, all may be for the best, but we do not go far from this place. Seven or eight leagues at the most. We will keep on the frontiers, for instance, and at the first alarm we can leave France. And what can we do there? Wait. But if they come, my brother's carriage will be here first. If I should happen to be any distance from you when the carriage comes for you, at dinner or supper, for instance, do one thing. What is that? Tell your good superior that in order that we may be as much together as possible, you ask her permission to share my repast. Will she permit it? What inconvenience can it be? Oh, delightful! In this way we shall not be separated for an instant. Well, go down to her, then, to make your request. I feel my head a little confused. I will take a turn in the garden. Go, and where shall I find you? Here, in an hour. Here, in an hour. Oh, you are so kind, and I am so grateful. How can I avoid interesting myself for one who is so beautiful and so amiable? Are you not the beloved of one of my best friends? Dear D'Artagnan, oh, how he will thank you! I hope so. Now, then. All is agreed. Let us go down. You are going down? Yes. Go along this corridor, down a little staircase, and you are in it. Excellent. Thank you. And the two women parted, exchanging charming smiles. Milady had told the truth. Her head was confused, for her ill-arranged plans clashed one another like chaos. She required to be alone that she might put her thoughts a little into order. She saw vaguely the future, but she stood in need of a little silence and quiet to give all her ideas, as yet confused, a distinct form and a regular plan. What was most pressing was to get Madame Bonacieux away, and convey her to a place of safety, and there, if matters required, 
make her a hostage. Milady began to have doubts of the issue of this terrible duel, in which her enemies showed as much perseverance as she did animosity. Besides, she felt as we feel when a storm is coming on, that this issue was near, and could not fail to be terrible. The principal thing for her then was, as we have said, to keep Madame Bonacieux in her power. Madame Bonacieux was the very life of D'Artagnan. This was more than his life, the life of the woman he loved. This was, in case of ill fortune, a means of temporizing and obtaining good conditions. Now, this point was settled. Madame Bonacieux, without any suspicion, accompanied her. Once concealed with her at Armentières, it would be easy to make her believe that D'Artagnan had not come to Bethune. In fifteen days at most, Rochefort would be back. Besides, during that fifteen days she would have time to think how she could best avenge herself on the four friends. She would not be weary, thank God, for she should enjoy the sweetest pastime such events could accord a woman of her character, perfecting a beautiful vengeance. Resolving all this in her mind, she cast her eyes around her, and arranged the topography of the garden in her head. Milady was like a good general who contemplates at the same time victory and defeat, and who is quite prepared, according to the chances of the battle, to march forward or to beat a retreat. At the end of an hour she heard a soft voice calling her. It was Madame Bonacieux's. The good abbess had naturally consented to her request and as a commencement they were to sup together. On reaching the courtyard, they heard the noise of a carriage which stopped at the gate. Milady listened. "'Do you hear anything?' said she. "'Yes, the rolling of a carriage.' "'It is the one my brother sends for us.' "'Oh, my God!' "'Come, come, courage!' The bell of the convent gate was sounded. Milady was not mistaken." "'Go to your chamber,' said she to Madame Bonacieux. "'You have perhaps some jewels you would like to take.' "'I have his letters,' said she. "'Well, go and fetch them, and come to my apartment. We will snatch some supper. We shall perhaps travel part of the night, and must keep our strength up.' "'Great God!' said Madame Bonacieux, placing her hand upon her bosom. "'My heart beats so I cannot walk.' Courage, courage! Remember that in a quarter of an hour you will be safe, and think that what you are about to do is for his sake. Yes, yes, everything for him. You have restored my courage by a single word. Go, I will rejoin you. Milady ran up to her apartment quickly. She there found Rochefort's lackey, and gave him his instructions. He was to wait at the gate. If by chance the musketeers should appear, the carriage was to set off as fast as possible, pass around the convent, and wait for Milady at a little village which was situated at the other side of the wood. In this case Milady would cross the garden and gain the village on foot. As we have already said, Milady was admirably acquainted with this part of France. If the musketeers did not appear, things were to go on as had been agreed. Madame Bonacieux was to get into the carriage as if to bid her adieu, and she was to take away Madame Bonacieux. Madame Bonacieux came in, and to remove all suspicion, if she had any, Milady repeated to the lackey before her the latter part of her instructions. Milady asked some questions about the carriage. It was a chaise drawn by three horses, driven by a postillion. Rochefort's lackey would precede it as courier. Milady was wrong in fearing that Madame Bonacieux would have any suspicion. The poor young woman was too pure to suppose that any female would be guilty of such perfidy. Besides, the name of the Comtesse de Winter, which she had heard the abbess pronounce, was wholly unknown to her, and she was even ignorant that a woman had had so great and so fatal a share in the misfortune of her life. "'You see,' said she, when the lackey had gone out, "'everything is ready. The abbess suspects nothing, and believes that I am taken by order of the cardinal. This man goes to give his last orders. Take the least thing, drink a finger of wine, 
and let us be gone. Yes, said Madame Bonacieux mechanically. Yes, let us be gone. The lady made her a sign to sit down opposite, poured her a small glass of Spanish wine, and helped her to the wing of a chicken. See, said she, if everything does not second us, here is night coming on. By daybreak we shall have reached our retreat, and nobody can guess where we are. Come, courage, take something. Madame Bonacieux ate a few mouthfuls mechanically, and just touched the glass with her lips. "'Come, come,' said Milady, lifting hers to her mouth. "'Do as I do.' But at the moment the glass touched her lips, her hand remained suspended. She heard something on the road which sounded like the rattling of a distant gallop. Then it grew nearer, and it seemed to her, almost at the same time, that she heard the neighing of horses. This noise acted upon her joy like the storm which awakens the sleeper in the midst of a happy dream. She grew pale and ran to the window, while Madame Bonacieux, rising all in a tremble, supported herself upon her chair to avoid falling. Nothing was yet to be seen, only they heard the galloping draw nearer. "'Oh, my God!' said Madame Bonacieux. "'What is that noise?' "'That of either our friends or our enemies.' said Milady, with her terrible coolness, "'Stay where you are, I will tell you.' Madame Bonacieux remained standing, mute, motionless, and pale as a statue. The noise became louder. The horses could not be more than a hundred and fifty paces distant. If they were not yet to be seen, it was because the road made an elbow. The noise became so distinct that the horses might be counted by the rattle of their hoofs. Milady gazed with all the power of her attention. It was just light enough for her to see who was coming. All at once, at the turning of the road, she saw the glitter of laced hats and the waving of feathers. She counted two, then five, then eight horsemen. One of them preceded the rest by double the length of his horse. Milady uttered a stifled groan. In the first horseman she recognized D'Artagnan. "'Oh, my God, my God!' cried Madame Bonacieux. "'What is it?' "'It is the uniform of the Cardinal's guards. Not an instant to be lost. Fly! Fly!' "'Yes, yes, let us fly,' replied Madame Bonacieux, but without being able to make a step, glued as she was to the spot by terror. They heard the horsemen pass under the windows. "'Come, then, come, then!' cried Milady, trying to drag the young woman along by the arm. Thanks to the garden, we can yet flee. I have the key, but make haste. In five minutes it will be too late. Madame Bonacieux tried to walk, made two steps, and sank upon her knees. Milady tried to raise and carry her, but could not do it. At this moment they heard the rolling of the carriage, which at the approach of the musketeers set off at a gallop. Then three or four shots were fired. "'For the last time, will you come?' cried Milady. "'Oh, my God, my God! You see my strength fails me. You see plainly I cannot walk. Flee alone!' "'Flee alone and leave you here? No, no, never!' cried Milady. All at once she paused. A livid flash darted from her eyes. She ran to the table— emptied into Madame Bonacieux's glass the contents of a ring, which she opened with singular quickness. It was a grain of a reddish colour, which dissolved immediately. Then, taking the glass with a firm hand, she said, "'Drink! This wine will give you strength. Drink!' And she put the glass to the lips of the young woman, who drank mechanically. "'This is not the way that I wish to avenge myself.' said Milady, replacing the glass upon the table with an infernal smile. But, my faith, we do what we can. And she rushed out of the room. Madame Bonacieux saw her go without being able to follow her. She was like people who dream they are pursued, and who in vain try to walk. A few moments passed. A great noise was heard at the gate. Every instant Madame Bonacieux expected to see Milady, but she did not return. Several times, with terror, no doubt, the cold sweat burst from her burning brow. At length she heard the grating of the hinges of the opening gates. 
the noise of boots and spurs resounded on the stairs there was a great murmur of voices which continued to draw near amid which she seemed to hear her own name pronounced all at once she uttered a loud cry of joy and darted toward the door she had recognized the voice of d'artagnan 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 cried she is it you this way this way constance constance replied the young man where are you where are you my god at the same moment the door of the cell yielded to a shock rather than open several men rushed into the chamber madame bonacieux had sunk into an armchair without the power of moving d'artagnan threw down a yet smoking pistol which he held in his hand and fell on his knees before his mistress athos replaced his in his belt porthos and aramis who held their drawn swords in their hands returned them to their scabbards oh d'artagnan my beloved d'artagnan you have come then at last you have not deceived me it is indeed thee yes yes constance reunited oh it was in vain she told me you would not come i hoped in silence i was not willing to fly oh i have done well how happy i am at this word she athos who had seated himself quietly started up she what she asked d'artagnan why my companion she who out of friendship for me wished to take me from my persecutors she who mistaking you for the cardinal's guards has just fled away your companion cried d'artagnan becoming more pale than the white veil of his mistress of what companion are you speaking dear constance of her whose carriage was at the gate of a woman who calls herself your friend of a woman to whom you have told everything her name her name cried d'artagnan my god can you not remember her name yes it was pronounced in my hearing once stop but it is very strange oh my god my head swims i cannot see help help my friends her hands are icy cold cried d'artagnan she is ill great god she is losing her senses while porthos was calling for help with all the power of his strong voice aramis ran to the table to get a glass of water but he stopped at seeing the horrible alteration that had taken place in the countenance of athos who standing before the table his hair rising from his head his eyes fixed in stupor was looking at one of the glasses and appeared a prey to the most horrible doubt oh said athos oh no it is impossible god would not permit such a crime water water cried d'artagnan water oh poor woman poor woman murmured athos in a broken voice madame bonacieux opened her eyes under the kisses of d'artagnan she revives cried the young man oh my god my god i thank thee madam said athos madam in the name of heaven whose empty glass is this mine monsieur said the young woman in a dying voice but who poured the wine for you that was in this glass she but who is she oh i remember said madame bonacieux the comtesse de winter the four friends uttered one and the same cry but that of athos dominated all the rest at that moment the countenance of madame bonacieux became livid a fearful agony pervaded her frame and she sank panting into the arms of porthos and aramis d'artagnan seized the hands of athos with an anguish difficult to be described and what do you believe his voice was stifled by sobs i believe everything said athos biting his lips till the blood sprang to avoid sighing d'artagnan d'artagnan cried madame bonacieux where art thou do not leave me you see i am dying d'artagnan released the hands of athos which he still held clasped in both his own and hastened to her her beautiful face was distorted with agony her glassy eyes had no longer their sight a convulsive shuddering shook her whole body the sweat rolled from her brow in the name of heaven run call 
Aramis, Porthos, call for help. Useless, said Athos, useless. For the poison which she pours, there is no antidote. Yes, yes, help, help, murmured Madame Bonacieux, help. Then, collecting all her strength, she took the head of the young man between her hands, looked at him for an instant as if her whole soul passed into that look, and with a sobbing cry pressed her lips to his. "'Constance! Constance!' cried D'Artagnan. A sigh escaped from the mouth of Madame Bonacieux, and dwelt for an instant on the lips of D'Artagnan. That sigh was the soul, so chaste and so loving, which reascended to heaven. D'Artagnan pressed nothing but a corpse in his arms. The young man uttered a cry, and fell by the side of his mistress as pale and as icy as herself. Porthos wept. Aramis pointed toward heaven. Athos made the sign of the cross. At that moment a man appeared in the doorway, almost as pale as those in the chamber. He looked around him and saw Madame Bonacieux dead, and D'Artagnan in a swoon. He appeared just at that moment of stupor which follows great catastrophes. "'I was not deceived,' said he. "'Here is Monsieur D'Artagnan, and you are his friends, Messieurs Athos, Porthos, and Aramis.' The persons whose names were thus pronounced looked at the stranger with astonishment. It seemed to all three that they knew him. "'Gentlemen,' resumed the newcomer, "'you are, as I am, in search of a woman who—' added he, with a terrible smile, "'must have passed this way, for I see a corpse.' The three friends remained mute, for although the voice as well as the countenance reminded them of someone they had seen, they could not remember under what circumstances. "'Gentlemen,' continued the stranger, "'since you do not recognize a man who probably owes his life to you twice, I must name myself. I am Lord de Winter, brother-in-law of that woman.' The three friends uttered a cry of surprise. Athos rose, and offering him his hand, "'Be welcome, my lord,' said he. "'You are one of us.' "'I set out five hours after her from Portsmouth,' said Lord de Winter. "'I arrived three hours after her at Boulogne. I missed her by twenty minutes at Saint-Omer. Finally, at Lillier, I lost all trace of her. I was going about at random, inquiring of everybody, when I saw you gallop past. I recognized Monsieur d'Artagnan. I called to you, but you did not answer me. I wished to follow you, but my horse was too much fatigued to go at the same pace with yours. And yet it appears, in spite of all your diligence, you have arrived too late. You see, said Athos, pointing to Madame Bonacieux dead, and to d'Artagnan, whom Porthos and Aramis were trying to recall to life. "'Are they both dead?' asked Lord de Winter, sternly. "'No,' replied Athos. "'Fortunately, Monsieur d'Artagnan has only fainted.' "'Ah, indeed, so much the better,' said Lord de Winter. At that moment d'Artagnan opened his eyes. He tore himself from the arms of Porthos and Aramis, and threw himself like a madman on the corpse of his mistress. Athos rose, walked toward his friend with a slow and solemn step, embraced him tenderly, and as he burst into violent sobs, he said to him with his noble and persuasive voice, "'Friend, be a man. Women weep for the dead. Men avenge them.' "'Oh, yes!' cried D'Artagnan. "'Yes! If it be to avenge her, I am ready to follow you.' Athos profited by this moment of strength which the hope of vengeance restored to his unfortunate friend, to make a sign to Porthos and Aramis to go and fetch the superior. The two friends met her in the corridor, greatly troubled and much upset by such strange events. She called some of the nuns, who against all monastic custom found themselves in the presence of five men. "'Madam,' said Athos, passing his arm under that of D'Artagnan, "'we abandon to your pious care the body of that unfortunate woman.' She was an angel on earth before being an angel in heaven. Treat her as one of your sisters. We will return some day to pray over her grave. D'Artagnan concealed his face in the bosom of Athos, and sobbed aloud. Weep, said Athos, weep 
heart full of love, youth, and life, alas, would I could weep like you. And he drew away his friend, as affectionate as a father, as consoling as a priest, noble as a man who has suffered much. All five, followed by their lackeys leading their horses, took their way to the town of Bethune, whose outskirts they perceived, and stopped before the first inn they came to. But, said D'Artagnan, shall we not pursue that woman? Later, said Athos, I have measures to take. She will escape us, replied the young man. She will escape us, and it will be your fault, Athos. I will be accountable for her, said Athos. D'Artagnan had so much confidence in the word of his friend that he lowered his head and entered the inn without reply. Porthos and Aramis regarded each other, not understanding this assurance of Athos. Lord de Winter believed he spoke in this manner to soothe the grief of D'Artagnan. "'Now, gentlemen,' said Athos, when he had ascertained there were five chambers free in the hotel, "'let every one retire to his own apartment. D'Artagnan needs to be alone, to weep, and to sleep. I take charge of everything. Be easy.' "'It appears, however,' said Lord de Winter, if there are any measures to take against the countess, it concerns me. She is my sister-in-law. And me, said Athos, she is my wife. D'Artagnan smiled, for he understood that Athos was sure of his vengeance when he revealed such a secret. Porthos and Aramis looked at each other and grew pale. Lord de Winter thought Athos was mad. Now, retire to your chambers, said Athos and leave me to act. You must perceive that in my quality of a husband this concerns me. Only, D'Artagnan, if you have not lost it, give me the paper which fell from that man's hat, upon which is written the name of the village of— Ah! said D'Artagnan, I comprehend, that name written in her hand. You see, then, said Athos, there is a God in heaven still. End of chapter. Chapter 64 of The Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 64. The Man in the Red Cloak. The despair of Athos had given place to a concentrated grief which only rendered more lucid the brilliant mental faculties of that extraordinary man. Possessed by one single thought, that of the promise he had made, and of the responsibility he had taken, he retired last to his chamber, begged the host to procure him a map of the province, bent over it, examined every line traced upon it, perceived that there were four different roads from Bethune to Armentières, and summoned the lackeys. Planchet, Grimaud, Bazin, and Mousqueton presented themselves, and received clear, positive, and serious orders from Athos. They must set out the next morning at daybreak, and go to Armentières, each by a different route. Planchet, the most intelligent of the four, was to follow that by which the carriage had gone upon which the four friends had fired, and which was accompanied, as may be remembered, by Rochefort's servant. Athos set the lackeys to work first because, since these men had been in the service of himself and his friends, he had discovered in each of them different and essential qualities. Then, lackeys who ask questions inspire less mistrust than masters, and meet with more sympathy among those to whom they address themselves. Besides, Milady knew the masters, and did not know the lackeys. On the contrary, the lackeys knew Milady perfectly. All four were to meet the next day at eleven o'clock. If they had discovered Milady's retreat, three were to remain on guard, the fourth was to return to Bethune in order to inform Athos and serve as a guide to the four friends. These arrangements made, the lackeys retired. Athos then arose from his chair, girded on his sword, 
enveloped himself in his cloak, and left the hotel. It was nearly ten o'clock. At ten o'clock in the evening, it is well known, the streets in provincial towns are very little frequented. Athos nevertheless was visibly anxious to find someone of whom he could ask a question. At length he met a belated passenger, went up to him, and spoke a few words to him. The man he addressed recoiled with terror, and only answered the few words of the musketeer by pointing. Athos offered the man half a pistole to accompany him, but the man refused. Athos then plunged into the street the man had indicated with his finger, but arriving at four crossroads, he stopped again, visibly embarrassed. Nevertheless, as the crossroads offered him a better chance than any other place of meeting somebody, he stood still. In a few minutes a night watch passed. Athos repeated to him the same question he had asked the first person he met. The night watch evinced the same terror, refused in his turn to accompany Athos, and only pointed with his hand to the road he was to take. Athos walked in the direction indicated, and reached the suburb situated at the opposite extremity of the city from that by which he and his friends had entered it. There he again appeared uneasy and embarrassed, and stopped for the third time. Fortunately, a mendicant passed, who, coming up to Athos to ask charity, Athos offered him half a crown to accompany him where he was going. The mendicant hesitated at first, but at the sight of the piece of silver which shone in the darkness he consented, and walked on before Athos. Arrived at the angle of a street, he pointed to a small house, isolated, solitary, and dismal. Athos went toward the house, while the mendicant, who had received his reward, left as fast as his legs could carry him. Athos went round the house before he could distinguish the door, amid the red color in which the house was painted. No light appeared through the chinks of the shutters, no noise gave reason to believe that it was inhabited it was dark and silent as the tomb. Three times Athos knocked without receiving an answer. At the third knock, however, steps were heard inside. The door at length was opened, and a man appeared of high stature, pale complexion, and black hair and beard. Athos and he exchanged some words in a low voice, then the tall man made a sign to the musketeer that he might come in. Athos immediately profited by the permission, and the door was closed behind him. The man whom Athos had come so far to seek, and whom he had found with so much trouble, introduced him into his laboratory, where he was engaged in fastening together with iron wire the dry bones of a skeleton. All the frame was adjusted except the head, which lay on the table. All the rest of the furniture indicated that the dweller in this house occupied himself with the study of natural science. There were large bottles filled with serpents, ticketed according to their species. Dried lizards shone like emeralds set in great blocks of black wood, and bunches of wild odoriferous herbs, doubtless possessed of virtues unknown to common men, were fastened to the ceiling and hung down in the corners of the apartment. There was no family no servant. The tall man alone inhabited this house. Athos cast a cold and indifferent glance upon the objects we have described, and at the invitation of him whom he came to seek sat down near him. Then he explained to him the cause of his visit, and the service he required of him. But scarcely had he expressed his request when the unknown, who remained standing before the musketeer, drew back with signs of terror, and refused. Then Athos took from his pocket a small paper, on which two lines were written, accompanied by a signature and a seal, and presented them to him who had made too prematurely these signs of repugnance. The tall man had scarcely read those lines, seen the signature, and recognized the seal, when he bowed to denote that he had no longer any objection to make, and that he was ready to obey. Athos required no more. He arose, bowed, went out, returned by the same way he came, re-entered the hotel, and went to his apartment. At daybreak D'Artagnan entered the chamber and demanded what was to be done. "'To wait,' replied Athos. 
Some minutes after, the superior of the convent sent to inform the musketeers that the burial would take place at midday. As to the poisoner, they had heard no tidings of her whatever, only that she must have made her escape through the garden, on the sand of which her footsteps could be traced, and the door of which had been found shut. As to the key, it had disappeared. At the hour appointed, Lord de Winter and the four friends repaired to the convent. The bells tolled, the chapel was open, the grating of the choir was closed. In the middle of the choir the body of the victim, clothed in her novitiate dress, was exposed. On each side of the choir and behind the gratings, opening into the convent, was assembled the whole community of the Carmelites, who listened to the divine service, and mingled their chant with the chant of the priests, without seeing the profane, or being seen by them. At the door of the chapel D'Artagnan felt his courage fall anew, and returned to look for Athos, but Athos had disappeared. Faithful to his mission of vengeance, Athos had requested to be conducted to the garden, and there upon the sand, following the light steps of this woman, who left sharp tracks wherever she went, he advanced toward the gate which led into the wood, and causing it to be opened, he went out into the forest. Then all his suspicions were confirmed. The road by which the carriage had disappeared encircled the forest. Athos followed the road for some time, his eyes fixed upon the ground. Slight stains of blood, which came from the wound inflicted upon the man who accompanied the carriage as a courier, or from one of the horses, dotted the road. At the end of three-quarters of a league, within fifty paces of Festubert, a larger blood-stain appeared. The ground was trampled by horses. Between the forests and this accursed spot, a little behind the trampled ground, was the same track of small feet as in the garden. The carriage had stopped here. At this spot Milady had come out of the wood and entered the carriage. Satisfied with this discovery which confirmed all his suspicions, Athos returned to the hotel and found Planchet impatiently waiting for him. Everything was as Athos had foreseen. Planchet had followed the road. Like Athos, he had discovered the stains of blood. Like Athos, he had noted the spot where the horses had halted. But he had gone farther than Athos, for at the village of Festubert, while drinking at an inn, he had learned without needing to ask a question that the evening before, at half-past eight, a wounded man who accompanied a lady travelling in a post-chaise had been obliged to stop, unable to go further. The accident was set down to the account of robbers, who had stopped the chaise in the wood. The man remained in the village, the woman had had a relay of horses, and continued her journey. Planchet went in search of the postillion who had driven her, and found him. He had taken the lady as far as Fromel. From Fromel she had set out for Armentières. Planchet took the crossroad, and by seven o'clock in the morning he was at Armentières. There was but one tavern, the post. Planchet went and presented himself as a lackey out of a place who was in search of a situation. He had not chatted ten minutes with the people of the tavern before he learned that a woman had come there alone about eleven o'clock the night before, had engaged a chamber, had sent for the master of the hotel, and told him she desired to remain some time in the neighborhood. Planchet had no need to learn more. He hastened to the rendezvous, found the lackeys at their posts, placed them as sentinels at all the outlets of the hotel, and came to find Athos, who had just received this information when his friends returned. All their countenances were melancholy and gloomy, even the mild countenance of Aramis. "'What is to be done?' asked D'Artagnan. "'To wait,' replied Athos. Each retired to his own apartment. At eight o'clock in the evening, Athos ordered the horses to be saddled, and Lord de Winter and his friends notified that they must prepare for the expedition." In an instant all five were ready. Each examined his arms, and put them in order. Athos came down last, and found D'Artagnan already on horseback, and growing impatient. "'Patience!' cried Athos. "'One of our party is still wanting.' 
the four horsemen looked around them with astonishment, for they sought vainly in their minds to know who this other person could be. At this moment Planchet brought out Athos's horse. The musketeer leaped lightly into the saddle. "'Wait for me,' cried he. "'I will soon be back,' and he set off at a gallop. In a quarter of an hour he returned, accompanied by a tall man, masked and wrapped in a large red cloak. Lord de Winter and the three musketeers looked at one another inquiringly. Neither could give the others any information, for all were ignorant who this man could be. Nevertheless, they felt convinced that all was as it should be, as it was done by the order of Athos. At nine o'clock, guided by Planchet, the little cavalcade set out, taking the route the carriage had taken. It was a melancholy sight that of these six men travelling in silence each plunged in his own thoughts sad as despair gloomy as chastisement end of chapter chapter 65 of the three musketeers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 65 Trial It was a stormy and dark night. Vast clouds covered the heavens, concealing the stars. The moon would not rise till midnight. Occasionally, by the light of a flash of lightning which gleamed along the horizon, the road stretched itself before them, white and solitary. The flash extinct, all remained in darkness. Every minute Athos was forced to restrain D'Artagnan, constantly in advance of the little troop, and to beg him to keep in the line, which in an instant he again departed from. He had but one thought, to go forward, and he went. They passed in silence through the little village of Festubert, where the wounded servant was, and then skirted the wood of Richebourg. At Hurlier, Planchet, who led the column, turned to the left. Several times Lord de Winter, Porthos, or Aramis tried to talk with the man in the red cloak, but to every interrogation which they put to him, he bowed without response. The travellers then comprehended that there must be some reason why the unknown preserved such a silence, and ceased to address themselves to him. The storm increased. The flashes succeeded one another more rapidly. The thunder began to growl, and the wind, the precursor of a hurricane, whistled in the plumes and the hair of the horsemen. The cavalcade trotted on more sharply. A little before they came to Fromel, the storm burst. They spread their cloaks. There remained three leagues to travel, and they did it amid torrents of rain. D'Artagnan took off his hat and could not be persuaded to make use of his cloak. He found pleasure in feeling the water trickle over his burning brow and over his body, agitated by feverish shudders. The moment the little troop passed Goscal and were approaching the post, a man sheltered beneath the tree detached himself from the trunk with which he had been confounded in the darkness, and advanced into the middle of the road, putting his finger on his lips. Athos recognized Grimaud. "'What's the matter?' cried Athos. "'Has she left Armentier?' Grimaud made a sign in the affirmative. D'Artagnan ground his teeth. "'Silence, D'Artagnan,' said Athos. "'I have charged myself with this affair. It is for me, then, to interrogate Grimaud.' "'Where is she?' asked Athos. Grimaud extended his hands in the direction of the lease. "'Far from here?' asked Athos. Grimaud showed his master his forefinger bent. "'Alone?' asked Athos. Grimaud made the sign, yes. "'Gentlemen,' said Athos, "'she is alone within half a league of us, in the direction of the river.' "'That's well,' said D'Artagnan. "'Lead us, Grimaud.' Grimaud took his course across the country and acted as guide to the cavalcade. At the end of five hundred paces, more or less, they came to a rivulet, which they forded. By the aid of the lightning they perceived the village of Erkingheim. "'Is she there, Grimaud?' 
asked Athos. Grimaud shook his head negatively. "'Silence, then!' cried Athos, and the troop continued their route. Another flash illuminated all around them. Grimaud extended his arm, and by the bluish splendour of the fiery serpent they distinguished a little isolated house on the banks of the river, within a hundred paces of a ferry. One window was lighted. "'Here we are,' said Athos. At this moment a man, who had been crouching in a ditch, jumped up and came toward them. It was Mousqueton. He pointed his finger to the lighted window. "'She is there,' said he. "'And Bazin?' asked Athos. "'While I watched the window, he guarded the door.' "'Good,' said Athos. "'You are good and faithful servants.' Athos sprang from his horse, gave the bridle to Grimaud, and advanced toward the window, after having made a sign to the rest of the troop to go toward the door. The little house was surrounded by a low, quick-set hedge, two or three feet high. Athos sprang over the hedge and went up to the window, which was without shutters, but had the half-curtains closely drawn. He mounted the skirting-stone that his eyes might look over the curtain. By the light of a lamp he saw a woman, wrapped in a dark mantle, seated upon a stool near a dying fire. Her elbows were placed upon a mean table, and she leaned her head upon her two hands, which were white as ivory. He could not distinguish her countenance, but a sinister smile passed over the lips of Athos. He was not deceived. It was she whom he sought. At this moment a horse neighed. Milady raised her head, saw close to the panes the pale face of Athos, and screamed. Athos, perceiving that she knew him, pushed the window with his knee and hand. The window yielded. The squares were broken to shivers, and Athos, like the spectre of vengeance, leaped into the room. Milady rushed to the door and opened it. More pale and menacing than Athos, D'Artagnan stood on the threshold. Milady recoiled, uttering a cry. D'Artagnan, believing she might have means of flight, and fearing she should escape, drew a pistol from his belt. But Athos raised his hand. "'Put back that weapon, D'Artagnan,' said he. "'This woman must be tried, not assassinated. Wait an instant, my friend, and you shall be satisfied. Come in, gentlemen.' D'Artagnan obeyed, for Athos had the solemn voice and the powerful gesture of a judge sent by the Lord himself. Behind D'Artagnan entered Porthos, Aramis, Lord de Winter, and the man in the red cloak. The four lackeys guarded the door and the window. Milady had sunk into a chair with her hands extended, as if to conjure this terrible apparition. Perceiving her brother-in-law, she uttered a terrible cry. "'What do you want?' screamed Milady. "'We want,' said Athos, "'Charlotte Baxon,' who first was called Comtesse de la Fere, and afterwards Milady de Winter, Baroness of Sheffield. "'That is I, that is I,' murmured Milady, in extreme terror. "'What do you want?' "'We want to judge you according to your crime,' said Athos. "'You shall be free to defend yourself. Justify yourself, if you can. Monsieur d'Artagnan, it is for you to accuse her first. D'Artagnan advanced. "'Before God and before men,' said he, "'I accuse this woman of having poisoned Constance Bonacieux, who died yesterday evening.' He turned toward Porthos and Aramis. "'We bear witness to this,' said the two musketeers, with one voice. D'Artagnan continued. "'Before God and before men, I accuse this woman of having attempted to poison me.' in wine which she sent me from Villeroy, with a forged letter, as if that wine came from my friends. God preserve me, but a man named Brisemont died in my place. "'We bear witness to this,' said Porthos and Aramis, in the same manner as before. "'Before God and before men, I accuse this woman of having urged me to the murder of the Baron de Ward. But as no one else can attest the truth of this accusation, I attest it myself. I have done." And D'Artagnan passed to the other side of the room with Porthos and Aramis. "'Your turn, my lord,' said Athos. The baron came forward. 
"'Before God and before men,' said he, "'I accuse this woman of having caused the assassination of the Duke of Buckingham.' "'The Duke of Buckingham assassinated!' cried all present with one voice. "'Yes,' said the Baron, "'assassinated. On receiving the warning letter you wrote to me, I had this woman arrested, and gave her in charge to a loyal servant. She corrupted this man. She placed the poniard in his hand. She made him kill the Duke. And at this moment, perhaps, Felton is paying with his head for the crime of this fury.' A shudder crept through the judges at the revelation of these unknown crimes. "'That is not all,' resumed Lord de Winter. "'My brother, who made you his heir, died in three hours of a strange disorder which left livid traces all over the body. My sister, how did your husband die?' "'Horror!' cried Porthos and Aramis. "'Assassin of Buckingham, assassin of Felton, assassin of my brother i demand justice upon you and i swear that if it be not granted to me i will execute it myself and lord de winter ranged himself by the side of d'artagnan leaving the place free for another accuser milady let her head sink between her two hands and tried to recall her ideas whirling in a mortal vertigo my turn said athos himself trembling as the lion trembles at the sight of the serpent. My turn! I married that woman when she was a young girl. I married her in opposition to the wishes of all my family. I gave her my wealth, I gave her my name, and one day I discovered that this woman was branded. This woman was marked with a fleur-de-lis on her left shoulder. Oh! said Milady, raising herself, I defy you to find any tribunal which pronounced that infamous sentence against me. I defy you to find him who executed it. Silence, said a hollow voice. It is for me to reply to that. And the man in the red cloak came forward in his turn. What man is that? What man is that? cried Milady, suffocated by terror, her hair loosening itself and rising above her livid countenance as if alive. All eyes were turned towards this man, for to all except Athos he was unknown. Even Athos looked at him with as much stupefaction as the others, for he knew not how he could in any way find himself mixed up with the horrible drama then enfolded. After approaching the lady with a slow and solemn step, so that the table alone separated them, the unknown took off his mask. The lady for some time examined with increasing terror that pale face, framed with black hair and whiskers, the only expression of which was icy impassibility. Then she suddenly cried, "'Oh, no, no!' rising and retreating to the very wall. "'Oh, no! It is an infernal apparition! It is not he! Help! Help!' screamed she, turning toward the wall as if she would tear an opening with her hands. "'Who are you, then?' cried all the witnesses of this scene. "'Ask that woman,' said the man in the red cloak, "'for you may plainly see she knows me.' "'The executioner of Lille! The executioner of Lille!' cried Milady, a prey to insensate terror, and clinging with her hands to the wall to avoid falling. Everyone drew back, and the man in the red cloak remained standing alone in the middle of the room. "'Oh, Grace! Grace! Pardon!' cried the wretch, falling on her knees. The unknown waited for silence, and then resumed. "'I told you well that she would know me. Yes, I am the executioner of Lille, and this is my history.' All eyes were fixed upon this man, whose words were listened to with anxious attention. That woman was once a young girl, as beautiful as she is today. She was a nun in the convent of the Benedictines of Templemar. A young priest, with a simple and trustful heart, performed the duties of the church of that convent. She undertook his seduction and succeeded. She would have seduced a saint. 
their vows were sacred and irrevocable their connection could not last long without ruining both she prevailed upon him to leave the country but to leave the country to fly together to reach another part of france where they might live at ease because unknown money was necessary neither had any the priests stole the sacred vases and sold them but as they were preparing to escape together they were both arrested eight days later she had seduced the son of the jailer and escaped the young priest was condemned to ten years of imprisonment and to be branded i was executioner of the city of lille as this woman has said i was obliged to brand the guilty one and he gentlemen was my brother i then swore that this woman who had ruined him who was more than his accomplice since she had urged him to the crime should at least share his punishment i suspected where she was concealed i followed her i caught her i bound her and i imprinted the same disgraceful mark upon her that i had imprinted upon my poor brother the day after my return to lille my brother in his turn succeeded in making his escape i was accused of complicity and was condemned to remain in his place till he should be again a prisoner my poor brother was ignorant of the sentence he rejoined this woman they fled together into berry and there he obtained a little courtesy this woman passed for his sister the lord of the estate on which the chapel of the curacy was situated saw this pretend sister and became enamoured of her amorous to such a degree that he proposed to marry her then she quitted him she had ruined for him she was destined to ruin and became the comtesse de la fere all eyes were turned toward athos whose real name that was and who made a sign with his head that all was true which the executioner had said then resumed he mad desperate determined to get rid of an existence from which she had stolen everything honour and happiness my poor brother returned to lille and learning the sentence which had condemned me in his place surrendered himself and hanged himself that same night from the iron bar of the loophole of his prison to do justice to them who had condemned me they kept their word as soon as the identity of my brother was proved i was set at liberty that is the crime of which i accuse her that is the cause for which she was branded monsieur d'artagnan said athos what is the penalty you demand against this woman the penalty of death replied d'artagnan my lord de winter continued athos what is the penalty you demand against this woman the punishment of death replied lord de winter messieurs porthos and aramis repeated athos you who are her judges what is the sentence you pronounce upon this woman the punishment of death replied the musketeers in a hollow voice milady uttered a frightful shriek and dragged herself along several paces upon her knees toward her judges Athos stretched out his hand toward her. "'Charlotte Baxon, Comtesse de la Fere, Milady de Winter,' said he, "'your crimes have wearied men on earth and God in heaven. If you know a prayer, say it, for you are condemned, and you shall die.' At these words, which left no hope, Milady raised herself in all her pride and wished to speak, but her strength failed her. She felt that a powerful and implacable hand seized her by the hair and dragged her away as irrevocably as fatality drags humanity. She did not, therefore, even attempt the least resistance, and went out of the cottage. Lord de Winter, d'Artagnan, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis went out close behind her. 
the lackeys followed their masters, and the chamber was left solitary, with its broken window, its open door, and its smoky lamp burning sadly on the table. End of chapter Chapter 66 of The Three Musketeers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 66 Execution It was near midnight. The moon, lessened by its decline, and reddened by the last traces of the storm, arose behind the little town of Armentières, which showed against its pale light the dark outline of its houses, and the skeleton of its high belfry. In front of them the lease rolled its waters like a river of molten tin, while on the other side was a black mass of trees, profiled on a stormy sky, invaded by large coppery clouds which created a sort of twilight amid the night. On the left was an old abandoned mill, with its motionless wings, from the ruins of which an owl threw out its shrill, periodical, and monotonous cry. On the right, and on the left of the road, which the dismal procession pursued, appeared a few low, stunted trees which looked like deformed dwarfs crouching down to watch men travelling at this sinister hour. From time to time a broad sheet of lightning opened the horizon in its whole width, darted like a serpent over the black mass of trees, and like a terrible scimitar divided the heavens and the waters into two parts. Not a breath of wind now disturbed the heavy atmosphere. A death-like silence oppressed all nature. The soil was humid, and glittering with the rain which had recently fallen, and the refreshed herbs sent forth their perfume with additional energy. Two lackeys dragged Milady, whom each held by one arm. The executioner walked behind them, and Lord de Winter, D'Artagnan, Porthos, and Aramis walked behind the executioner. Planchet and Bazin came last. The two lackeys conducted Milady to the bank of the river. Her mouth was mute, but her eyes spoke with their inexpressible eloquence, supplicating by turns each of those on whom she looked. Being a few paces in advance, she whispered to the lackeys, a thousand pistoles to each of you, if you will assist my escape. But if you deliver me up to your masters, I have near at hand avengers who will make you pay dearly for my death. Grimaud hesitated. Mousqueton trembled in all his members. Athos, who heard Milady's voice, came sharply up. Lord de Winter did the same. "'Change these lackeys,' said he. "'She has spoken to them. They are no longer sure.' Planchet and Bazin were called, and took the places of Grimaud and Mousqueton. On the bank of the river the executioner approached Milady and bound her hands and feet. Then she broke the silence to cry out, "'You are cowards, miserable assassins! Ten men combined to murder one woman! Beware! If I am not saved, I shall be avenged!' "'You are not a woman!' said Athos, coldly and sternly. You do not belong to the human species. You are a demon escaped from hell. Whither we will send you back again. Ah, you virtuous men, said Milady. Please to remember that he who shall touch a hair of my head is himself an assassin. The executioner may kill, without being on that account an assassin said the man in the red cloak, rapping upon his immense sword. This is the last judge. That is all. Nachrichter, as say our neighbors, the Germans. And as he bound her while saying these words, Milady uttered two or three savage cries, which produced a strange and melancholy effect in flying away into the night, and losing themselves in the depths of the woods. If I am guilty— if I have committed the crimes you accuse me of, shrieked Milady, take me before a tribunal. You are not judges. You cannot condemn me. I offered you Tyburn, 
said Lord de Winter. Why did you not accept it? Because I am not willing to die, cried Milady, struggling. Because I am too young to die. The woman you poisoned at Bethune was still younger than you, madam, and yet she is dead, said D'Artagnan. I will enter a cloister, I will become a nun, said Milady. You were in a cloister, said the executioner, and you left it to ruin my brother. Milady uttered a cry of terror and sank upon her knees. The executioner took her up in his arms and was carrying her toward the boat. Oh, my God! cried she. My God, are you going to drown me? These cries had something so heart-rending in them that Monsieur d'Artagnan, who had been at first the most eager in pursuit of Milady, sat down on the stump of a tree and hung his head, covering his ears with the palms of his hands, and yet, notwithstanding, he could still hear her cry and threaten. D'Artagnan was the youngest of all these men. His heart failed him. "'Oh, I cannot behold this frightful spectacle,' said he. I cannot consent that this woman should die thus. Milady heard these few words and caught at a shadow of hope. D'Artagnan, D'Artagnan, cried she, remember that I loved you. The young man rose and took a step toward her. But Athos rose likewise, drew his sword, and placed himself in the way. If you take one step farther, D'Artagnan, said he, we shall cross swords together. D'Artagnan sank on his knees and prayed. "'Come,' continued Athos, "'executioner, do your duty.' "'Willingly, Monseigneur,' said the executioner, "'for as I am a good Catholic, I firmly believe I am acting justly in performing my functions on this woman.' "'That's well.' Athos made a step toward Milady. "'I pardon you.' said he, the ill you have done me. I pardon you for my blasted future, my lost honour, my defiled love, and my salvation forever compromised by the despair into which you have cast me. Die in peace. Lord de Winter advanced in his turn. I pardon you, said he, for the poisoning of my brother, and the assassination of his grace Lord Buckingham. I pardon you for the death of poor Felton. I pardon you for the attempts upon my own person. Die in peace. And I, said Monsieur d'Artagnan, pardon me, madam, for having by a trick unworthy of a gentleman provoked your anger, and I, in exchange, pardon you the murder of my poor love and your cruel vengeance against me. I pardon you, and I weep for you. Die in peace. I am lost, murmured Milady in English. I must die. Then she arose of herself, and cast around her one of those piercing looks which seemed to dart from an eye of flame. She saw nothing, she listened, and she heard nothing. Where am I to die? said she. On the other bank, replied the executioner. Then he placed her in the boat, and as he was going to set foot in it himself, Athos handed him a sum of silver. Here, said he, is the price of the execution, that it may be plain we act as judges. That is correct, said the executioner, and now, in her turn, let this woman see that I am not fulfilling my trade, but my debt. And he threw the money into the river. The boat moved off toward the left-hand shore of the Lys, bearing the guilty woman and the executioner. All the others remained on the right-hand bank, where they fell on their knees. The boat glided along the ferry rope, under the shadow of a pale cloud which hung over the water at that moment. The troop of friends saw it gain the opposite bank. The figures were defined like black shadows on the red-tinted horizon. Milady, during the passage, had contrived to untie the cord which fastened her feet. On coming near the bank, she jumped lightly on shore and took to flight. But the soil was moist. On reaching the top of the bank, she slipped and fell upon her knees. She was struck, no doubt, with a superstitious idea. 
she conceived that heaven denied its aid, and she remained in the attitude in which she had fallen, her head drooping, and her hands clasped. Then they saw from the other bank the executioner raise both his arms slowly. A moonbeam fell upon the blade of the large sword. The two arms fell with a sudden force. They heard the hissing of the scimitar and the cry of the victim. Then a truncated mass sank beneath the blow. The executioner then took off his red cloak, spread it upon the ground, lay the body in it, threw in the head, tied all up by the four corners, lifted it on his back, and entered the boat again. In the middle of the stream he stopped the boat, and suspending his burden over the water cried in a loud voice, "'Let the justice of God be done!' and he let the corpse drop into the depths of the waters, which closed over it. Three days afterward the four musketeers were in Paris. They had not exceeded their leave of absence, and that same evening they went to pay their customary visit to Monsieur de Treville. "'Well, gentlemen,' said the brave captain, "'I hope you have been well amused during your excursion.' "'Prodigiously,' replied Athos in the name of himself and his comrades. End of chapter Chapter 67 of The Three Musketeers This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 67 Conclusion On the sixth of the following month the king, in compliance with the promise he had made the cardinal to return to La Rochelle, left his capital still in amazement at the news which began to spread itself of Buckingham's assassination. Although warned that the man she had loved so much was in great danger, the queen, when his death was announced to her, would not believe the fact, and even imprudently exclaimed, "'It is false. He has just written to me.' But the next day she was obliged to believe this fatal intelligence. Laporte, detained in England, as everyone else had been, by the orders of Charles I, arrived, and was the bearer of the duke's dying gift to the queen. The joy of the king was lively. He did not even give himself the trouble to dissemble, and displayed it with affectation before the queen. Louis the Thirteenth, like every weak mind, was wanting in generosity. But the king soon again became dull and indisposed. His brow was not one of those that long remain clear. He felt that in returning to camp he should re-enter slavery. Nevertheless, he did return. The cardinal was for him the fascinating serpent, and himself the bird which flies from branch to branch without power to escape. The return to La Rochelle, therefore, was profoundly dull. Our four friends in particular astonished their comrades. They travelled together, side by side, with sad eyes and heads lowered. Athos alone from time to time raised his expansive brow. A flash kindled in his eyes, and a bitter smile passed over his lips. Then, like his comrades, he sank again into reverie. As soon as the escort arrived in a city, when they had conducted the king to his quarters, the four friends either retired to their own or to some secluded cabaret, where they neither drank nor played. They only conversed in a low voice, looking around attentively, to see that no one overheard them. One day, when the king had halted to fly the magpie, and the four friends, according to their custom, instead of following the sport, had stopped at a cabaret on the high road, a man coming from La Rochelle on horseback pulled up at the door to drink a glass of wine, and darted a searching glance into the room where the four musketeers were sitting. "'Hallo, Monsieur d'Artagnan,' said he. "'Is not that you whom I see yonder?' D'Artagnan raised his head and uttered a cry of joy. It was the man he called his phantom. It was his stranger of Meung, of the Rue des Fossoyeurs, and of Arras. D'Artagnan drew his sword and sprang toward the door. But this time, instead of avoiding him, 
the stranger jumped from his horse and advanced to meet d'artagnan ah monsieur said the young man i meet you then at last this time you shall not escape me neither is it my intention monsieur for this time i was seeking you in the name of the king i arrest you how what do you say cried d'artagnan i say that you must surrender your sword to me monsieur and that without resistance this concerns your head i warn you who are you then demanded d'artagnan lowering the point of his sword but without yet surrendering it i am the chevalier de rochefort answered the other the equerry of monsieur le cardinal richelieu and i have orders to conduct you to his eminence we are returning to his eminence monsieur the chevalier said athos advancing and you will please to accept the word of monsieur d'artagnan that he will go straight to la rochelle i must place him in the hands of guards who will take him into camp we will be his guards monsieur upon our word as gentlemen but likewise upon our word as gentlemen added athos knitting his brow monsieur d'artagnan shall not leave us the chevalier de rochefort cast a glance backward and saw that porthos and aramis had placed themselves between him and the gate he understood that he was completely at the mercy of these four men gentlemen said he if monsieur d'artagnan will surrender his sword to me and join his word to yours i shall be satisfied with your promise to convey monsieur d'artagnan to the quarters of monseigneur the cardinal you have my word monsieur and here is my sword this suits me the better said rochefort as i wish to continue my journey if it is for the purpose of rejoining milady said athos coolly it is useless you will not find her what has become of her then asked rochefort eagerly return to camp and you shall know rochefort remained for a moment in thought then as they were only a day's journey from Sergere, whither the cardinal was to come to meet the king he resolved to follow the advice of athos and go with them besides this return offered him the advantage of watching his prisoner they resumed their route on the morrow at three o'clock in the afternoon they arrived at Sergere. the cardinal there awaited louis the thirteenth the minister and the king exchanged numerous caresses felicitating each other upon the fortunate chance which had freed france from the inveterate enemy who set all europe against her after which the cardinal who had been informed that d'artagnan was arrested and who was anxious to see him took leave of the king inviting him to come the next day to view the work already done upon the dyke on returning in the evening to his quarters at the bridge of la pierre the cardinal found standing before the house he occupied d'artagnan without his sword and the three musketeers armed this time as he was well attended he looked at them sternly and made a sign with his eye and hand for d'artagnan to follow him d'artagnan obeyed we shall wait for you d'artagnan said athos loud enough for the cardinal to hear him his eminence bent his brow stopped for an instant and then kept on his way without uttering a single word d'artagnan entered after the cardinal and behind d'artagnan the door was guarded his eminence entered the chamber which served him as a study and made a sign to rochefort to bring in the young musketeer rochefort obeyed and retired d'artagnan remained alone in front of the cardinal this was his second interview with richelieu and he afterward confessed that he felt well assured it would be his last richelieu remained standing leaning against the mantelpiece a table was between him and d'artagnan monsieur said the cardinal you have been arrested by my orders so they tell me monseigneur do you know why no monseigneur for the only thing for which i could be arrested is still unknown to your eminence richelieu looked steadfastly at the young man hullo said he what does that mean if monseigneur will have the goodness to tell me in the first place what crimes are imputed to me 
I will then tell him the deeds I have really done. Crimes are imputed to you which have brought down far loftier heads than yours, monsieur, said the cardinal. What, monseigneur? said D'Artagnan, with a calmness which astonished the cardinal himself. You are charged with having corresponded with the enemies of the kingdom. You are charged with having surprised state secrets. You are charged with having tried to thwart the plans of your general. And who charges me with this, monseigneur? said D'Artagnan, who had no doubt the accusation came from a lady. A woman branded by the justice of the country? A woman who has espoused one man in France and another in England? A woman who poisoned her second husband and who attempted both to poison and assassinate me? What do you say, monsieur? cried the cardinal, astonished. And of what woman are you speaking thus? Of Milady de Winter, replied D'Artagnan. Yes, of Milady de Winter, of whose crimes your eminence is doubtless ignorant, since you have honoured her with your confidence. Monsieur, said the cardinal, if Milady de Winter has committed the crimes you lay to her charge, she shall be punished. She has been punished, monseigneur. And who has punished her? We. Oui. She is in prison. She is dead. Dead, repeated the cardinal, who could not believe what he heard. Dead. Did you not say she was dead? Three times she attempted to kill me, and I pardoned her. But she murdered the woman I loved. Then my friends and I took her, tried her, and condemned her. D'Artagnan then related the poisoning of Madame Bonacieux in the convent of the Carmelites at Bethune, the trial in the isolated house, and the execution on the banks of the Lys. A shudder crept through the body of the cardinal, who did not shudder readily. But all at once, as if undergoing the influence of an unspoken thought, the countenance of the cardinal, till then gloomy, cleared up by degrees, and recovered perfect serenity. So, said the cardinal, in a tone that contrasted strongly with the severity of his words, you have constituted yourselves judges, without remembering that they who punish without license to punish are assassins? Monseigneur, I swear to you that I never for an instant had the intention of defending my head against you. I willingly submit to any punishment your eminence may please to inflict upon me. I do not hold life dear enough to be afraid of death. Yes, I know you are a man of a stout heart, monsieur, said the cardinal, with a voice almost affectionate. I can therefore tell you beforehand you shall be tried, and even condemned. Another might reply to your eminence that he had his pardon in his pocket. I content myself with saying, Come in, Monseigneur, I am ready. Your pardon? said Richelieu, surprised. Yes, Monseigneur, said D'Artagnan. And signed by whom? By the king? And the cardinal pronounced these words with a singular expression of contempt. No, by your eminence. By me. You are insane, monsieur. Monseigneur will doubtless recognize his own handwriting. And D'Artagnan presented to the cardinal the precious piece of paper which Athos had forced from Milady, and which he had given to D'Artagnan to serve him as a safeguard. His eminence took the paper, and read in a slow voice, dwelling upon every syllable. December 3rd, 1627. It is, by my order, and for the good of the State, that the bearer of this has done what he has done. Richelieu. The cardinal, after having read these two lines, sank into a profound reverie, but he did not return the paper to D'Artagnan. He is meditating by what sort of punishment he shall cause me to die, said the Gascon to himself. Well, my faith, he shall see how a gentleman can die. The young musketeer was in excellent disposition to die heroically. Richelieu still continued thinking, rolling and unrolling the paper in his hands. At length he raised his head, fixed his eagle look upon that loyal, open, and intelligent countenance, 
read upon that face, furrowed with tears, all the sufferings its possessor had endured in the course of a month, and reflected for the third or fourth time how much there was in that youth of twenty-one years before him, and what resources his activity, his courage, and his shrewdness might offer to a good master. On the other side, the crimes, the power, and the infernal genius of Milady had more than once terrified him. He felt something like a secret joy at being forever relieved of this dangerous accomplice. Richelieu slowly tore the paper, which D'Artagnan had generously relinquished. "'I am lost,' said D'Artagnan to himself, and he bowed profoundly before the cardinal, like a man who says, "'Lord, thy will be done.' The cardinal approached the table, and, without sitting down, wrote a few lines upon a parchment, of which two-thirds were already filled, and affixed his seal. "'That is my condemnation,' thought D'Artagnan. "'He will spare me the ennui of the Bastille, or the tediousness of a trial. That's very kind of him.' "'Here, monsieur,' said the cardinal to the young man, "'I have taken from you one carte blanche.' to give you another. The name is wanting in this commission. You can write it yourself." D'Artagnan took the paper hesitatingly, and cast his eyes over it. It was the lieutenant's commission in the musketeers. D'Artagnan fell at the feet of the cardinal. "'Monseigneur,' said he, "'my life is yours. Henceforth dispose of it. But this favour which you bestow upon me, I do not merit.' I have three friends who are more meritorious and more worthy. You are a brave youth, D'Artagnan, interrupted the cardinal, tapping him familiarly on the shoulder, charmed at having vanquished this rebellious nature. Do with this commission what you will. Only remember, though the name be blank, it is to you I give it. I shall never forget it, replied D'Artagnan. Your eminence may be certain of that. The cardinal turned and said in a loud voice, Rochefort! The chevalier, who no doubt was near the door, entered immediately. Rochefort, said the cardinal, you see Monsieur d'Artagnan. I receive him among the number of my friends. Greet each other, then, and be wise if you wish to preserve your heads. Rochefort and D'Artagnan coolly greeted each other with their lips, but the cardinal was there, observing them with his vigilant eye. They left the chamber at the same time. "'We shall meet again, shall we not, monsieur?' "'When you please,' said D'Artagnan. "'An opportunity will come,' replied Rochefort. "'Hey?' said the cardinal, opening the door. The two men smiled at each other, shook hands, and saluted his eminence. "'We were beginning to grow impatient,' said Athos. "'Here I am, my friends,' replied D'Artagnan, "'not only free, but in favour. Tell us about it. This evening, before the moment, let us separate.' Accordingly, that same evening, D'Artagnan repaired to the quarters of Athos, whom he found in a fair way to empty a bottle of Spanish wine, an occupation which he religiously accomplished every night. D'Artagnan related what had taken place between the cardinal and himself, and, drawing the commission from his pocket, said, "'Here, my dear Athos, this naturally belongs to you.' Athos smiled with one of his sweet and expressive smiles. "'Friend,' said he, for Athos this is too much. For the Comte de la Fere it is too little. Keep the commission, it is yours. Alas, you have purchased it dearly enough." D'Artagnan left Athos's chamber and went to that of Porthos. He found him clothed in a magnificent dress covered with splendid embroidery, admiring himself before a glass. "'Ah, ah! Is that you, dear friend?' exclaimed Porthos. How do you think these garments fit me? Wonderfully, said D'Artagnan, but I come to offer you a dress which will become you still better. What? asked Porthos. That of a lieutenant of musketeers. 
D'Artagnan related to Porthos the substance of his interview with the cardinal, and said, taking the commission from his pocket, "'Here, my friend, write your name upon it and become my chief.' Porthos cast his eyes over the commission and returned it to D'Artagnan, to the great astonishment of the young man. "'Yes,' said he, "'yes, that would flatter me very much, but I should not have time enough to enjoy the distinction. During our expedition to Bethune, the husband of my duchess died. So, my dear, the coffer of the defunct holding out its arms to me, I shall marry the widow. Look here! I was trying on my wedding suit. Keep the lieutenancy, my dear, keep it." The young man then entered the apartment of Aramis. He found him kneeling before a prie dieu with his head leaning on an open prayer-book. He described to him his interview with the cardinal, and said, for the third time, drawing his commission from his pocket, "'You, our friend, our intelligence, our invisible protector, accept this commission. You have merited it more than any of us by your wisdom and your counsels, always followed by such happy results.' "'Alas, dear friend,' said Aramis, our light adventures have disgusted me with military life. This time my determination is irrevocably taken. After the siege I shall enter the house of the Lazarists. Keep the commission, D'Artagnan. The profession of arms suits you. You will be a brave and adventurous captain." D'Artagnan, his eye moist with gratitude, though beaming with joy, went back to Athos, whom he found still at table, contemplating the charms of his last glass of Malaga by the light of his lamp. "'Well,' said he, "'they likewise have refused me.' "'That, dear friend, is because nobody is more worthy than yourself.' He took a quill, wrote the name of D'Artagnan in the commission, and returned it to him. "'I shall then have no more friends,' said the young man. "'Alas, nothing but bitter recollections.' and he let his head sink upon his hands, while two large tears rolled down his cheeks. "'You are young,' replied Athos, "'and your bitter recollections have time to change themselves into sweet remembrances.'" End of chapter This is the epilogue of The Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by, hmm, Mark Smith, I think, of Simpsonville, South Carolina, he says. Ah, well, let us get on to the story. The Three Musketeers, by my friend Alexandre Dumas. CHAPTER THE LAST EPILOGUE La Rochelle, deprived of the assistance of the English fleet, and of the diversion promised by Buckingham, surrendered after a siege of a year. On the 28th of October, 1628, the capitulation was signed. The king made his entrance into Paris on the 23rd of December of the same year. He was received in triumph, as if he came from conquering an enemy, and not Frenchmen. He entered by the Faubourg Saint-Jacques, under verdant arches. D'Artagnan took possession of his command. Porthos left the service, and in the course of the following year married Madame Coquenard. The coffer so much coveted contained eight hundred thousand livres. Mousqueton had a magnificent livery, and enjoyed the satisfaction of which he had been ambitious all his life, that of standing behind a gilded carriage. Aramis, after a journey into Lorraine, disappeared all at once, and ceased to write to his friends. They learned at a later period, through Madame de Chevreuse, who told it to two or three of her intimates, that, yielding to his vocation, he had retired into a convent, only into which nobody knew. Bazin became a lay brother. Athos remained a musketeer under the command of D'Artagnan till the year 1633, at which period, after a journey he made to Touraine, he also quit the service, under the pretext of having inherited a small property in Roussillon. 
Grimaud followed Athos. D'Artagnan fought three times with Rochefort, and wounded him three times. "'I shall probably kill you the fourth, said he to him, holding out his hand to assist him to rise. "'It is much better both for you and for me to stop where we are,' answered the wounded man. "'Morbleu, I am more your friend than you think, for after our very first encounter I could, by saying a word to the cardinal, have had your throat cut.' They this time embraced heartily, and without retaining any malice. Planchet obtained from Rochefort the rank of sergeant in the Piedmont Regiment. Monsieur Benassier lived on very quietly, wholly ignorant of what had become of his wife, and caring very little about it. One day he had the imprudence to recall himself to the memory of the cardinal. The cardinal had him informed that he would provide for him so that he should never want for anything in the future. In fact, Monsieur Bonacieux, having left his house at seven o'clock in the evening to go to the Louvre, never appeared again in the Rue des Fossoyeurs. The opinion of those who seemed to be best informed was that he was fed and lodged in some royal castle at the expense of his generous eminence. This is the end of The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas, translated by William Robson. It has been a delight for you to listen to my story, and I thank you so very much. Adieu to you.